Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Miriam Axel, and I'm a postdoctoral scholar at the California Institute for Energy and Environment here at the Center for IT Research for the Interests of Society, or Citrus. Um, I'm also an honorary research scholar at Imperial College London's uh, Center for Environmental Policy. Welcome to the 14th year of the Citrus Research Exchange seminar series. We've hosted a remarkable lineup of technology innovators in person at Siddhartha Dai Hall, and we're very glad to see all of you joining virtually today for the fall 2022 series. Before we begin the talk, I want to first highlight a few upcoming Citrus events. The next Citrus Research Exchange will be held on Wednesday, October 5th from 12 to 1 p.m. Pacific time for a discussion on teleoperated social robots, designing for an inclusive future with Veronica Ahamuda, assistant professor, director of the technology and social connectedness laboratory, at UC Davis Health Pediatrics Center for Health and Technology. Please be sure to check out the Citrus webpage for registration details and further details, updates. Few virtual participation guidelines before we get into the talk. Please post all of your questions in the question and answer box on Zoom. You should see a Q&A icon on your Zoom toolbar. Clicking the thumbs up icon on a question will bring it to the top of the Q&A window and questions will be addressed at the end of the talk. Today, we're joined by Professor Kaveh Madani. Kaveh Madani is a globally recognized environmental scientist, educator, and activist working on complex human nature systems at the interface of science, policy, and society. He's currently the head of the Nexus Research Program at the United Nations University in Dresden, Germany, UNU Flores. He has previously served as the deputy head of Iran's Department of Environment and vice president of the UN Environment Assembly Bureau. He's held different strategic roles during his public service and led Iran's delegation in different major intergovernmental summits, including the COP23 climate change negotiations. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the Environmental and Water Resources Institute and has received numerous awards and recognitions for his fundamental research contributions, teaching innovations and outreach and humanitarian activities. It is my very great honor to welcome Kavi Madani. Thank, thank you so much, Miriam, for the very generous uh, introduction and thank you, um, Citrus, for, for the invitation. It's always great to um, connect back with, with California. Those of you who um, don't know, I'll, I got my PhD at UC Davis and did my postdoc at UC Riverside. And I you know, worked uh, over the years, even as visit, visiting scientists, uh, every few years coming back to California, uh, spending time at different UCs. So it's, it's really um, great to um, connect uh, with, with um, friends and colleagues, so I say hi to those who know me. Um, um, today's talk is essentially, um, hopefully, a, 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 a thought-provoking um, talk in a sense that it, it tells us um, a little bit about, like, you know, my practical experience and why I have learned in, in the real world that some of the things we do in academia um, is very far from the real world, something that I'm trying to um, address these days through research and working at the United Nations um, University. Um, so, so if you don't have um, time actually to listen to the whole talk, my main, my mes main message um, today is on the first slide. Um, and, and that is uh, the, you know, two plus two is, is not four. And it, uh, we are dealing with with systems that are by far more complex than what you know the um, summation of, of of their parts. And when Aristotle uh, talked about greater um, you know systems with greater um, that are greater than the sum of their parts, he meant it in a positive way. But I I, I mean it in a very cynical way. Um, today and and hopefully that grabs our attention as a person who spent um and who got degrees in civil engineering the first thing we we learn in in, in hydraulics is that water um, falls down it, it moves toward the elevation later on 
Um, I, I, you know, I, I did my postdoc in water resources economics and learned that we only do things that uh, are um, um, economically justified. And then, um, you know, spend time in politics and realize that all of these things can be violated. All of these rules of physics and 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 you know laws, economic laws and principles. And and the good example is is what is happening in California. Water can go uphill when when needed even if it's economically um the, the you know not making sense because the politics of reality you know the game is 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 very different and today um the situation is is uh, going out of control when it comes to water this year in particular we have heard about the impact of water scarcity in many regions around the world we are hearing about uh, the um the sec national security implications of water scarcity and water bankruptcy. And this is very scary as the world is not ready to deal with this situation. This is the message I delivered to the UN Secretary General last December, um, telling him that we really have not planned very well for, uh, for the current um, situation. So now on the positive side, we are in the fourth industrial revolution. I'm connecting to you through Zoom. Um, um, you know, virtual connections are feasible. Now we can compute um, and, and, and measure data science. Is, it has made significant improvements. AI is, is, is doing, you know, is helping us with everything these days. Our cell phones are stronger than the computers people like me used to run their models not long, long ago during our PhD research. Uh, so we can compute, we can measure, we can collect, we have satellites to, to um, do remote sensing with. So it seems that there is no problem with computation and data collection, yet um, there is a major problem with, with our understanding. And what is scary today is that the, the, the computational power might give us a false confidence and we think that we understand systems. And I think what is happening around the world today tells us that we don't understand the systems very well, even if we have a lot of data points. I think we learned this very well during the COVID-19 crisis, um, give, you know, to know how bad we are and how um, weak we are in, in making projections and, and modeling based on data. Just look at the models that we use to predict the, 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 the future of the pandemic. And there is no single model in the world which, which proved to be correct in the projections and, and predictions. Uh, so, so what you think at the first glance and what you think would make sense doesn't necessarily make sense. And there is a big, you know, we need a process to convert data to information, to knowledge, to insight, and, and in, into wisdom. And if that doesn't exist, that process doesn't exist, which seems to be the problem today, because a lot of us are getting more and more shallower in, in terms of the, the work we are doing. We get excited about the data parts and, and, and um, playing with the data and, and developing uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning models, and so on. And we get, we, we, a lot of times we don't understand the real complexities within the system. And if, th if that happens, then conspiracy theory can win. And again, we saw this during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. There are lots of positive developments, but the past in industrial revolutions are also telling us that, that, you know, every every revolution, every improvement can come with some unintended consequences and with with some unplanned actually um, impacts. And, and if you are, you know, we are realistic and we become less arrogant, we pay attention to this fact and we understand that all of the positive developments today can also have some some negative impacts in the long run. And we've got to be careful about those and become less arrogant. Um, um, so, so let's talk about what is wrong with the way we still solve the problem, even though we have we are computationally much stronger than before. Uh, the first thing is like how we formulate the problem. Still, in in science and engineering, the way we train our students, we do our research is is based on a linear thinking paradigm. We have a desired state and a present situation. We define our problem. Uh, we make a decision or come up with a solution. Um, to to change the environment, as an example, is you know there is water shortage. Let's build a dam. I mean that's something we did in California. Let's let's take water out of the ground. Let's build desalination plants and and so on. And 
this is unfortunately a, a, a linear thinking paradigm, but this is what we are doing. What we don't do is to think about how the solution we provide can, can have an impact on the problem it, itself and what the unintended consequences of these solutions can be. Good examples, again, around you in California, uh, you build dams, you see the ecological impacts, you, 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 you transfer water to Southern California, you see other impacts, you build desalination plants, you see the unintended consequences, you still see the, the, you know, the thirst is not going away either. So what is, what, is, what is wrong with this? And I'm sharing an example, which is very similar, and I think people in California can connect very well too, is, is in a basin in Iran, where I come from. And, and a, a region which um, has a lot of um, different sorts of, of, of water use in the urban sector, agricultural sector, industrial sector. It is environmentally significant there is there, because there is an important river flow, flowing through a city called Isfahan, the former capital of Iran. And then there is a, and there is a, a wetland preserved by the Ramsar Convention at the end of, the, at the end of this um, river system. Um, the system has high population, and, and then what they have tried to do is, you know, they have tried to address water shortage through extensive water transfers. And again, similar problem to Southern California, uh, which we have, you know, how, how Californians have tried to address um, the water demand of Central Valley in Southern California through extensive water transfer. Yet, as in California, we see um, the problem coming back. This is me on the bed of the Zayander Root River um, in, I think, 2016. And, and you know, it is, it is a disaster because the, the, the identity of this city is tied um, to, to this river, you know, tourist attraction. Imagine, you know, London without Thames or the big, you know, cities that, that have, or, you know, German cities without Rhine or with a dry um, Rhine. So, so it is, it is a big, big problem. Now look, let's look at how this system is working. We have a reservoir upstream, a river, which is flowing through urban areas and agricultural areas, the city of Isfahan, and then eventually and, ends in the Gulf Huni Marsh or wetland. And, and, and then because the population has increased and industrial demand and agricultural demand has, has followed, um, increased, uh, um, has come with it, then, then we are, uh, we have. They have tried to do multiple water transfer projects, finding water in different donor basins nearby in wetter areas because this is central Iran, a bit drier than the rest of the, the neighboring regions, and they have tried to address the problem through transfer. Exactly the same system we we have seen in California, but the system is 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 now um, getting scary. You see some German because now I, I work in Germany, uh, uh, work for Germany actually, I'm in Toronto right now. Uh, uh, but um, what we have seen in, in, in recent years is, is, is that a lot of people in the donor basin is, are complaining, like the complaints in, in Northern California about what a transfer to Southern California or the, you know, the problems that the environmentalists are, um, are, are raising or, what 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 um, is urban population in Northern California uncomfortable with, or 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 farmers who are uncomfortable with water going further south. Um, same situation in Iran. Last year we had major, you know, deadly demonstrations um, and and made over water scarcity, and and people were complaining about this situation. People got shot and died, just like today. And it's a it, you know it's a sad day for for. For you know, it's one of the sad days of Iran today, um, and you know my 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 thoughts are with the brave Iranians who are now um, young young men and women who are fighting for their um, for their freedom and for women's right. And if you have time, uh, please take a look at the story, and and if possible, um, play, please um, um, support support them in any way you can on social media and be their voice and. Uh, unfortunately, I, I got messages. There are people who wanted to join from Iran, but the government has shut down the internet because they want to control the restricted demonstrations. But anyway, last year we had this this um, situation, and 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 people got shot. Now, 
They were complaining about why water is being transferred, why water should go to other basin. But but this is the what what is happening in donor basin, and that's that's normal. We you know eventually you run run out of water in the donor basin, and people would complain. Now, how how many people have, you know? But people don't talk about the donor basin much, uh, the the recipient basin much. What we saw a few months after the demonstrations in the donor basin was a lot of complaints and this you know similar demonstrations in the, in in the destination. Uh, basin essentially in the recipient basin, which has also received the water, but 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 is also thirsty still. They are thinking that they're not get, getting enough water. The um, water has been shut down, and 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 their systems are failing. Strikes by farmers, um, regular citizens. We have seen explosions of 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 water transfer systems over the years, and and this problem has kept uh, coming back every time at a different scale. So some time ago, I started modeling this system as a water resources person. I started with a hydrological model, just to tell you how smart I am. Um, there are differential equations behind all these components that you see in this system, surface water, groundwater, all of these connected in you know, um, hydrology would do a lot of that. But then I came to a point where I had to um, you know, after calculating my available groundwater, surface water for the system, um, um, and how much water we have available as water supply, I had to calculate the the you know come up with with um, water demand um, values. And and normally as engineers we get those values from others. We have scenarios: um, low growth, medium you know business as usual, and high growth. And and we we you know use that in the model and run the model. But this case. Fortunately, I didn't know um, at the time, I, my, my economics was not good. I didn't know the supply demand curve. And I, I started thinking about the dynamics of, of demand and what drives demand. So part of it is, is agriculture, 90% of water is allocated to, to the agriculture sector. So what happens in the agriculture sector matters with the help of a PhD student. We developed a, an agent-based model essentially, which, which models how, how farmers make decisions about their crops, which sort of crops they 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 grow based on the price signal they get, and so on, uh, and 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 then um, the other component was was the, still the domestic water demand and industrial water demand. What drives the you know um, the growth in this sector? And if I look, you know, when I looked at the history of the basin, realized that the my immigration is uh, migration to this basin is, is pretty high compared to some neighboring basins. So water availability in itself is, um, is, is, is the driver. When you make water available, the, the, attract, the, the region becomes more attractive. The same is true about economic growth. When you make water available, economic growth becomes possible and this region keeps to attract people like Los Angeles, like Southern California. Now, how, you know, when you, consider these elements and you bring them into a, 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 a water model, your model is no longer a water model, only it's not a hydrologic model. You have a complex system and that you can run under different scenarios. And, and that's what we do as, as modelers. We run the model under different scenarios. We look at the different the changes in the different variables of interest, how population is changing, how water demand is changing, what's happening to water shortage, what we can do to do things better. And we run the model under different scenarios. And with this, you know, you can publish a very good paper and high impact in a, in a, in a journal with a high impact factor. But that would not do any good and would not solve any problem in, in real world. Still, you have to communicate something that people didn't know because a lot of people uh, without you telling them, know that if you reduce the water demand in California, you can solve the problem. If you 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 know, or some say, raise the price of water, uh, water consumption might be reduced. If you increase the efficiency, this and that and that and that. So all the typical things we hear about the boring water engineers like me are the things that that everyone knows, and the managers and the policymakers know know those better than many of us in academia indeed. So the so what question is important here. We needed to understand what, what are the driving dynamics behind this, this system. And with what we looked at, you know, we looked further and further into the results of the model under different scenarios, which we found something very interesting and, and um, um, I think not, not very promising. Uh, and that is when you implement with the implementation of every water transfer project, water shortage 
reduces and it continues to reduce for a while. But but after that, we see an increase in water shortage. And that was, you know, there we had a question of why, why this is this is happening. And when we dug further and further and further, we we went into understanding of, of you know the causal dynamics behind it. And the causal dynamics was interesting. Uh, we have water scarcity in the region. How do we respond? through a technological change, through building a dam, through digging deeper, you know, making our, our, our wells deeper ground and extracting groundwater, transferring water, building desalination and so on. Through this, we increase the water supply. And that is a balancing act that engineers are interested in. We're fixers, we, we go and fix the issue. What we don't pay attention to, however, is that with the increase of, in water supply, when you don't control demand on the other side, um, you, the watershed development continues. So you promote development in a water scarce region, re region by providing water to it. And, and, and then that means ex extra growth, expansion of the ag sector, um, additional people coming into the region, industrial growth and so on. And that means increased water demand. So, so then you create a, a reinforcing loop that neutralizes the impact of your balancing loop and then you're left with a problem which is worse than worse than the initial situation this is in in system dynamics we call this as fix that backfires archetype but you know the problem is that we have focused on the problem symptom rather than addressing the main main cause and and then there are unintended consequences that can make the situation worse now can we do things differently yes um, because there are different um, there are different measures that we we can implement to guess some of these unintended consequences. Remember the COVID nineteen crisis, the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, we needed the vaccine badly, but but every every person in the med in the medical business knows that that drugs can and, and you know medicine can come is associated with the unintended consequences. So they had to go through a lot of tests and tests and tests. Still what they approved and we all got, you know, is associated with with unintended consequences and, and impacts it, you know, the vaccine might have called, you know, in the long run even might have some negative impacts on us. Who knows? Um, but but in that field, this is this is known. This is a given practice. People do that. You don't invent a drug and, and and put it on the shelf tomorrow. You have to you have to go through a process. That process doesn't exist in engineering and technological innovation. We we develop, we sell. People get used to it, and then we are we we say, wait a minute, this is not good. Stop using it. And conserve. Do this. Do that. Now, I, I presented just one archetype for you here, but there are multiple other archetypes that you can take a look at and 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 study uh, if you like. Another example, a very good example, is irrigation efficiency improvement. A lot of times when there is water scarcity, people talk about irrigation efficiency improvement. And if you do that, if you switch to drip irrigation, especially in the developing world, when, when flood irrigation is still is, is, is a dominant practice, uh, you think that, that water consumption would be reduced. But that's not true in, in many places, including California. Uh, what we have seen is, is that when you increase the efficiency. If you have no plan for for reducing consumption and controlling consumption, what happens is that farmers have more water at at their disposal. So they either expand their irrigated land or switch to thirstier crops because they have water. So that the you know irrigation efficiency improvement on itself is an incomplete solution, which can make the make the situation worse. Same as building a dam. Desalin you know, building a desalination plant, transferring water, and so on. This doesn't mean that the technology is bad or technological interventions are bad, but what it means is that we need to think about, about, about other things and complement our solutions with other measures that make sure that we get the result that we want. That becomes possible if we, we switch our lean linear thinking paradigm with nonlinear thinking paradigm. And think, try to guess, study, and and project some of the some of the unintended consequences. Now, remember, unintended consequences would remain unintended. There are a lot of things that we can't even guess. There are a lot of consequences that appear in the long run, 
but but if we think try to think about those we might be able to get some of those and we that that can help us do better again also this experience this past experience of the unintended consequences tell uh, tell tells us that that we have to become less arrogant and know that we don't know it all so that was the first issue with the way we model and we we study things and and we 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 train our students and, and, and experts and engineers and so on. So we got to internalize externalities and, and the externalities and understand that we are only successful if we don't um, you know, create new problems by solving uh, one problem. As, as you see, there are different um, images of, of some of my colleagues that I've worked with um, and there are different citations that you can refer to if you like to study more about um, some of these topics. Now. When I entered the political world, um, I knew that water systems are, are, are complex and I've done a lot of work on the human side of things and I understand the complex uh, water human systems. Um, so this was my world, um, a world of, of you know, water, water um, human systems, boundary rationality, um, you know, causalities, uh, the causal relationships everywhere, um, on huge uncertainty with the, with the system, our limited ability to predict the, the outcome of the system, and evolutionary changes because of the human behavior and how human how, how human um, makes decisions and so on and and, and mimic you know how how uh, it, humans follow each other in certain occasions. And then in recent years, we have talked about non-stationarity of these systems that that history might not necessarily repeat and things. Um, can go in different ways because we're dealing with dynamic systems and, and we don't have a good knowledge of how they might evolve in the in the in the future. But when I went into the real world and tried to address water problems, I realized that that water is simply a very small component of a much, much larger complex human nature system or human environment system, which has other components that we talk about, you know, all the time, food, energy, um, environment, you know, water, food, energy, nexus, these are the terms that we use um, these days. Uh, but, but the system is even more complex because there are also other sectors that are very, very important and sometimes much more important to the policymakers than the systems that we are dealing with. Or, or trying to solve problems in. And, and the question is, how do you solve problem in one of these sectors if you disregard the connections with the interconnections with and interdependencies um, uh, that they have with, with other sectors? Now, you can dig into each of these sectors. They become very, very complex themselves. Uh, but, but, then, but then the question is, can you really, really solve them within their own territories? And I think we learned very good examples again during the pandemic. And that was when, when people, doc, you know, they were in their health, you know, sector territory. Um, a lot of a lot of health experts, um, when the pandemic came, came up with the solution of stay at home, social distancing, without thinking about the economic consequences of this. What what this can do to the economy because they were thinking about the, you know their own sector their own territory and we saw prime ministers presidents resisting this this you know issuing this order until the very last minute or when when the the, the numbers were getting scary uh, because they understood the relationship of, of the health sector with so many other um, other sectors that ne needed to be taken into account. And we, we are still seeing the consequences of some of those decisions that have been made two, three years ago. Now, another major issue exists here in complex systems, and that is, um, by definition, complex problems have no solution, period. There is no way we can solve the problem completely. They're def they come by nature, they're like this. You fix something somewhere and then you create another problem somewhere else. Now, the question is which one of those solutions are acceptable because the down downstream uh, problems you create are, are, are minimal. There are trade-offs in these systems and you continuously need to deal with these trade-offs. If you don't understand that, these problems have no solution. And your job 
um, is to navigate through complexity rather than to end the problem and solve the problem completely, then you 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 rely too much on technology or you you, you think um, that you you know a lot and, and you can't solve the problem. Indeed, you can't. The reason that many, many, many politicians, actually many policymakers get fooled by consultants and engineers and, and technology makers um, is that they don't understand this complexity. They don't understand that these water problems would be with us forever, environmental. So their nature might change, their, their, their definition, their, their um, boundaries and so on, but what, we will have water problems as long as humans are on this planet. We will have problems in the economic sector forever. We will have problems. There is no single measure that can solve these problems and there is no innovation that we can make that address all that addresses all these problems and that's that's very important but complexity is very very hard to explain if i go to to state tv and talk about the pandemic and tell people that you stay at home there's no guarantee that you won't die you get a shot there is no guarantee that you won't die you go to work that so, and we don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow and this and that, we don't even know where this virus has come from. We don't know if our, our medicine would work and, and, and not. Would they follow my, my, my explanation if I talk to them about trade-offs, uncertainties and the dark future or to the conspiracy theorist which ha who has a simple answer for all the questions they have. And that is the problem we have with complex systems. They're easy to explain through conspiracy theories, but very, very extremely hard to explain through science and real science. And this is the, the problem that we need to continuously deal with. Now, another issue we have is how we set agendas um, to deal with these problems in, in, the real, in the real world. Now, for us, water is a very big deal. Environment is a very big deal climate change is, is, is an existential threat. But this is not necessarily the case. Um, um, this is not the way the policymakers think. This is the, one of the very first papers I wrote after politics, coming back to academia. And that was about how do we think and how, we pro, how do we uh, prioritize problems in, 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 in policymaking? And um, I borrowed the, the simple Eisenhower um, the matrix that um, you know, we, we read that he was using for his for his schedule for his scheduling his, his tasks and I think that's applicable with a little tweak to to how we we set um, policy agendas we go after the problems with our which are both urgent and important and we are talking about relative importance and relative urgency um, compared to other problems. Where do they stand? We all, you know, and normally we only have the bandwidth to 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 focus on those. The rest we talk about planning about the future, how we to, need to tackle those in the future. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. Water is not considered as the most pressing issue in many societies. It's not doesn't have the you know highest relative importance and highest relative urgency it it becomes more important and more urgent when when there is a crisis you got a flood you got a drought you got a um, you got a situation that that is pressing the whole country or or a region or 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 province or state and that is when when everyone is talking about it that is when there is a window of opportunity to take actions that is when california managed to pass some new laws about its groundwater a reduction of water water use in southern california if the drought um, you know the la last decade's drought didn't exist if in 2014, 15, the situation would, you know, had not been that bad, some of these laws wouldn't have existed. And we, with these extreme events, we, we, we find those chances, but it's a risky business to rely on extreme events to come and force us to change. But that's the reality. In, in some societies now we have talked more about climate change and, and we, have, we, we have even, you know, in a way that that some people think climate change is the cause of all, of all other environmental problems, and it's more important than, for example, deforestation or 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 water shortage or pollution or what, whatever else, like all those other problems that are interconnected with climate change. But but still, climate change is not the on the earth address first territory. But this wasn't the case in the case of COVID nineteen. It wasn't why because it was killing people. It what you know even the pandemic 
was not being seen as an address first issue in the eyes of the policymakers when people from that you know the the country that the policymakers lived in um, started dying when when people were dying in China the rest of the world was was inactive when people were dying in Iran and Italy the United States was, was not taking action still they were thinking it would would be a flu and 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 you know nothing major but when it started killing so same same thing for us that is why a lot of us um, in academia unfortunately and this is not a good idea I think and it's um, it's not constructive we use every opportunity we see a wildfire a water shortage anything related to the environment to prove that climate change is 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 an issue so we climatize some of these events which might not be really you know driven by climate change but that is a window of opportunity when the koala images out people pay attention to climate change more than other times. So narrative building becomes very, very challenging and very important if you understand this sort of the, the, the why relative urgency and importance matters, um, then you spend a lot of time in building narratives which make sense for every society. Unfortunately, the, the narratives that we have built globally are not applicable to every region. And that's something we got to understand. The, the narrative which would work in California would not work in Texas, would not work in Florida. And you got to change this narrative in every location. Same is true. The people who are in Iran today fighting for, for their freedom, people who are getting shot at and people who are dying cannot think about the future generations and what's going to happen in 2050s because they're not they're not even aware if they, they would be alive tomorrow or not. So talking to them about those problems might not you know, create a sense of urgency for them. We got to understand the problems of every society and, and tweak our narratives. And that is something I understood very well in, in, the, in the real world. When I was in, when in academia, I kept talking about the science policy gap and I tried to get closer and closer to the policymakers till a point that I became one of those. But once I, I sat at, you know, behind my desk, I realized that sometimes even you know, the solution that I think makes sense scientifically are valid, um, are not being welcomed by the society, by environmental activists, um, because I'm, I haven't connected with them very well. Like, you know, I haven't talked to them very well. They're, they're not they're not aware of my narrative and the way I think and and so on. So so this relationship is incomplete and in, I think ineffective unless all, all the sides of the triangle uh, are there. So if you're only talking about the science policy uh, relationship and you are, are, are not considering the, the importance and significance of the, 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 the society, I think you're not moving the target forward and, and you're not necessarily getting there. Uh, and, and why is that? Because even in dictatorships, even in, in places where, you know, when there is no democracy, um, politicians pay attention to the way people think and the, the way people to what pe to what people want, right? Why is the internet now shut down in Iran? Because because uh, you know the way people think is driven by the exchange of data and, and exchange of information. And if you stop the flow of information, you can control the way people think, and then there's less pressure on you to change behavior. Um, now the scientists. Are the game changers there? Can 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 help with the cha change of um, the way people think? And and then then if you have science science together with society pr putting pressure on on policymakers, you can expect some change. Now, because we don't have much time left, I'm I'm going to talk about just uh, one or two more issues and then um, um, start the Q and A. Um, now, another issue that we have when solving problems in, in our modeling business is that we don't think necessarily about how practical our solution is. If you look at the way we have dealt with climate change, we are every IPCC report, every every paper we, we write are full of those optimal solutions that we think must be implemented, that must be implemented, you know, reduce um fossil fuel energy consumption, switch to renewables, do this, make your economy green, you know, all those, all those things that we keep hearing about. But that what, what we what is happening around us, fossil fuel energy consumption is increasing um, around the world, 
greenhouse gas emissions are increasing and, and so on. Because we, we, we are thinking about point B and we know the point A and, and, and um, we, want, you know, we keep talking about that beautiful point B and, and the solutions that must be there um, when we reach point B. Well, we never talk about how to reach from point A to point B, the pathways. The reality and something I have worked extensively on is, is to prove that the, the, the optimal solution, the better solution might not be necessarily practical or stable. And if you continue talking about that optimal solution, and only want that optimal solution to happen, you lose the chance of making incremental improvements that can make the system better than before and pave the way for the big changes to, to happen. And I think this is another major issue that we have. We talk about the ideals. We run our models for the best case, assuming that everyone is working together assuming the optimal point is reachable, and then we make prescriptions that never make sense to the policymakers who don't understand the system differently. And that is why they see the, our solutions as garbage and, 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 and useless. Well, another assumption we are making in, let's say, talking about climate change issues or solving the water problems in California or addressing the water bankruptcy in, in the Colorado River Basin is, the assumption of, of, of perfect cooperation between everyone. Uh, we, we assume that um, multiple, cri multiple criteria, multi-objective problems can be, uh, multi-stakeholder problems can be turned into multiple objective problems. And then we assume that there's perfect cooperation between all the agents and they can implement the ideal and the optimal solution. The reality is not like this. There is no dictator in the system and everyone is fighting for his or her, her uh, benefits. And that is okay. We got to understand what stakeholders are doing and why they are pursuing certain strategies to get to what they, they want. And unless we don't understand their, their um, individual rationality um, principles, we would not be able to offer a solution which is acceptable to all parties. Um, so I, I think um, I ended here with saying with this image to, to say that if you know if you dig it dig deeper and deeper and look at how people make decision you realize that every every bad problem has a good reason every pro, every decision maker has a, a good reason for the way um, uh, for the way that they have um, you know shown a certain behavior or made it made a decision uh, why do I use this image on one side I have a, an ISIS um, terrorist on one side, I have a firefighter who has saved lives. One, one is you know, taking lives and the other one is, is saving lives. Both uh, risk their lives and both are proud of the outcome. I can't call one irrational and one rational because the rational one thinks closer to me, but I won't be able to solve the terrorism problem unless I understand the way the terrorist thinks, why he thinks this way, what his, 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 incentives are and how his utility function looks like and why, why his, he has a certain reasoning. If I want to offer a solution that works, you can call a, a lot of these politicians stupid, irrational, crazy, but they have a smart way of thinking that works for themselves. Unless we understand them, we cannot necessarily change the way they think and we cannot offer a solution that would work for them. So, you know, just, to end it here, uh, the, the take home messages is, is that two plus two is not necessarily four. We have to solve the problems without creating new ones, but let's not forget that there is no solution. There is no single solution that can solve um, complex problems. We would always have unintended consequences and we jump from one problem to another. These problems would be with us. The systems and the problems with which we are dealing with might be our world and might be the, the biggest and craziest problem we think um, is out there in the world. But the reality is that problem is a tiny bit of, of the problem, you know, the many the many problems in the universe. And, and another thing to remember is, is that we got to, to distinguish between what is practical and what is optimal. And then don't dismiss 
the value of some suboptimal solutions, which are extremely better than the current situation and the status quo. We have to sell those and, and make those also available to the decision makers. Um, now, I, I, I said a lot of negative things here to, to you know, um, remind ourselves how much we don't know, but, but that doesn't mean that we can't do a lot of good things. I think we, with with less arrogance, with with you know deeper thinking and modeling and understanding, we can address these problems and help the decision makers and societies come navigate through complexity and do not um, um, develop and implement solutions that have that are extremely irreversible. If they implement irreversible solutions, they're in there are no way back, and and the situation can get worse in the years. Um, to come. So with this, I, I thank all the students uh, who have helped me over the years and have contributed um, to um, to my my research. I've enjoyed and working with them and have learned uh, a lot from them. Um, happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Kavi. That was wonderful. Um, and it was really good to hear as well about the, the students that you worked with. And I think uh, we have a couple of questions here in the, the Q&A, and I encourage our, our listeners as well to feel free to submit their questions. Um, I'd love to first start with a question about your experience and your experience with, with modeling. What have you learned that you think can be applied in a practical sense? And especially for those who might be starting out their careers, students and, and people who are looking to to apply things in a very practical sense, what do you think you have learned that that you think um, applies best in, in a practical sense? Uh, you know, so I, I think mod modeling, the type of modeling I did, I was doing um, optimization modeling, what you know, what's best, simulation what modeling, what if, and I was doing game theory and human behavior modeling. So. Um, and before going into the, uh, the real world, I, I, I think I did some work which um, tried to um, highlight the pros and cons of these different approaches, what sort of insights we can gain from each and why each of them is, is absolutely incomplete and can, cannot uh, be a, a crystal ball and tell us what is happening in the real world. Um, so, so I would say that I train myself as, as a person, and I, I, this is what I do with my students. I tell them, um, I care about the way you can formulate problems, and and and, and you know, I and let's let's do things, um, make make our approach problem oriented rather than rather than um, tool oriented. If you only train yourself with tools, if the only thing you know is AI and this, and you don't have any understanding of of, of the problem. Uh, you might be able to solve one problem, but that you go to another problem, you cannot formulate it. You fail because you want to take your tool from this problem to 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 that problem. I think understanding these differences, understanding why 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 the optimal solution is infeasible when you 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 bring the rational individual rationality into um, under the radar, helped me a lot with designing solutions, building narratives. Actually, later on when I I went to politics. And also negotiations, because I had to do a lot of international negotiations. Oh, thank you. I think next we have a question from Joanna Gutierrez. She's asking, in your opinion, how do you think technology has evolved to help support the human side of water and energy management? And what are you most hopeful for? Uh, well, I have to understand what what you mean by by the human side. Um, I mean that needs a little elaboration, and if you you, you can type that if if you will. But um, you know, we are here because of those technological innovations. Um, so we can complain about the um, the unintended consequences, and I think that's the right thing to do. We can question the 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 previous generations because the next generations would also question us, and that's their right. Uh, but we are here because of those, um, and and those are, you know, something that we we take for granted. Um, a lot of people on this planet right now don't have access to 
um, to simple technologies that that can provide them with with you know health and sanitation services. Um, they don't have toilets. They don't have access to water. And you can look at their economies and and where they stand and the efficiency of water use and and the productivity of water, their income from agriculture, and you see those are very different with with those places where access to technologies has not been the problem. Um, but but. There are also many rich countries in the world, including the Middle Eastern countries, that that have had no problems with the uh, with the techno technology access, but they still have not been able to solve their problems completely. I think understanding that technology is is needed, and we have to invest in technological innovation. It helps um, the way. Uh, we live, the standards of living improve the standard of, of, of living. But on the other hand, technology is not um, the only solution we need to think about. And we have to combine hard solutions with, with soft solutions, technological and engineering solutions with policy solutions to, to, to move the, the system in, into the zone that we want is, is something that can make us more and more hopeful and constructive. Um, so I'm, I'm really Thankful to all those engineers who have invented things, uh, to those who have built dams. Although I, I fight against a lot of dams today as an activist, and uh, but I think that's how we got to this point. In agricultural revolution became feasible by by the the um, groundwater pumping technology. Um, living in many places became feasible because of water transfer. Desalination has been helpful to many nations. Wastewater recycling has been helpful, but that you know, you know, but still there are problems that, that associated with these technologies that we need to take into account. Your answer also brings up some there relates to another question that's about um, how to convey these issues. You have a question uh, from Sanan Mamouzi who says they're an environmental journalist, and you were speaking about narrative building when you first talked about that this is important when it comes to complex environmental issues. Um, what advice would you have for the media about how best to relay the message of scientists and explain these really complicated, complex topics correctly? So so what was the journalist's name? If you may. Uh, Sanam Mamouzi. Okay, so okay, I think you know. So she she's writing for for Reuters and and Al Jazeera, very um, you know a great journalist. And thanks for for coming. I mean, the first step is is to come to these meetings, and that's it's great that you are doing so. But um, second is don't go, don't get frustrated with the peer pressure. And I think that's something I at least see in your articles that. Everyone is selling something that is attractive. Editors like you to climatize all problems. Editors like you to simplify all problems and, and blame like, you know, all, all, all the problems on a certain politician or this and that and that. Don't get fooled by, by you know, by, I, and I know it's it's hard because when you pitch something to the to the editors, they might not like it. When you write it, they might not like it. And eventually even, even some, some people, the readers might not like it. But how, that's how you, you change the game, you become influential. I think in, in the climate change world that you also contribute to, we are seeing that, you know, how destructive this climatization um, has become because, for example, in parts of the world, when you blame everything on, on, on climate change, you are essentially um, dis are disabling or paralyzing the environmental activists or environmental defenders on, in those countries who have for years, or scientists even, that for years have tried to uh, help hold governments accountable for their actions and have asked for, for changes. You, you come up with a narrative which makes sense in Washington, DC, or some, some parts of Europe, and, and they, you know, people like those narratives, but there, you know, in other places where you want a change and impact, your narrative is actually totally, um, helpful to those who have created the problems. I think this is this is the important thing. And and just promoting this that for every place we need a different narrative. We need narratives should should match um, the the concerns of, of every society, the needs of their society. The, their narrative should be about the things that the societies care about, not this the narrative the, the things that you know um, other people in other parts of the world um, care about, and and we see this. I mean, that is why a lot of people people in the developed world in the global south think a lot of things we say here are, you know, nonsense because 
we're asking for a, for a lifestyle which doesn't have have meat and doesn't have big houses and where we use bikes and 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 we become vegan and 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 all those things that we talk about but they watch us watch the hollywood movies who is who is making those speeches the obese person and the fat person who is, has eaten steaks for all all his or her life is talking about why the world should go vegan and those people are are you know dealing with hunger issues those are the people who can't eat who who created the problem we did it and when when it comes to their development we we might be stopping them and we don't want them to develop in the way we, we did but we are not willing to change our lifestyle and pay the price or help even help them help them develop in a different way so people feel the injustice there and their narratives become counterproductive and the media become untrustworthy Thank you. Um, and I think your next question is about looking for solutions and recommendations for if we're talking about qualitative parameters and information to uh, quantitative questions and systems, systems and modeling thinking on environmental studies, do you have any general solutions or recommendations to help convert these qualitative parameters to quantitative parameters? I mean, I, I wish I, I had, I think um, it is, it is, you know, these are um, case by case. First of all, you know, we don't have to convert everything into um, numbers to be able to come up with a useful solution. System dynamics, which I talked about today, for example, is a capable tool, not because it, it's based on differential equation, but because it, it's it's taken it into account causal relationships between different variables. Once you, if you want to develop your model, your quantitative model, you have to pass a, an important stage, and that is developing your causal loop diagrams. And that's by far the hardest part of the, you know, developing a system dynamics model. Later on, you can convert everything to, to numbers. And, and, you know, you know that there are speculations. Your model is eventually wrong and some of the guesses uh, are irrelevant. Uh, you make approximations and so on. But what matters is the causal loop diagrams that you develop. If you paid attention, even when I tried to present my, my results and my major finding, I converted all, all that, you know, complex causal loop diagrams and my model into a simple causal loop diagram, which was an archetype that I could explain. With game theory modeling, it's the same thing. I don't need to know how much you exactly value um, this product versus this product. As long as I know you prefer this one to this one, I'm, I'm, I'm done. A lot of decision-making models that we use rely on qualitative information or ordinal information, and still we are fine with it. And indeed, it's unhealthy and, and not helpful to convert everything into, into numbers. And sometimes those can be very misleading. If you look at the multiple criteria, decision-making um, literature, multi-objective programming literature, there are also discussions of, of some methods that, that heavily rely on quantitative information and, 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 and uh, why they, they, have, they result in, in misleading uh, conclusions. So um, I think there is no general recommendation, but I, my general recommendation is don't, don't discount the, the value or overlook the value of actually qual qualitative models and a qualitative thinking. Um, um, and, and I think that's, and don't get frustrated by those modelers around you who, who think that you have to convert everything to numbers. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And I think your excellent talk has spurred a whole bunch of questions. I think if you're happy to do a quick lightning round, we have a few a few questions remaining in the, the chat. Um, we have one from Afshin who's saying, uh, our current global system functions based on a monetary profit and revenue as the driving factor. How can we change this? So, so great question. So uh, theoretically, theoretically, we can say, yes, we, we, we can change this by reminding people about the uh, value of other attributes, right? And, and people, for example, in the UN system um, do this. Um, I, I was responsible to write a the uh, kind of a de definition of a green recovery um, for for UNEP and 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 define what what the UN system means when it refers to green recovery from the pandemic 
And, and there, one of the major things I highlighted also uh, through the input of, of others also um, was, was the fact that, that you know, this, this way of um, thinking where, you know, GDP is the major thing and, and we are based on um, success is measured based on production and, and, and profit um, leaves no incentive to do things differently. Yet we can remind nations about the value of health. We can remind nations about the value of other, um, you know, different human factors and, and so on, education, this and that and that and that. In theory, we do that and we, can, we need to continue doing so. Uh, we also have to convince the rich the rich of the world who who set the standards of living for others who you know who show them the ultimate um uh, i would say attributes of modernization and 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 a modern life and a good life to to act live differently and, and think differently that's why it is extremely valuable to 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 have the the leaders of you know the big tech company leaders um in your campaign to, to do things differently and, and promote different values. But that's the, thing to, that's the theoretical side of it. And it's one side of it that we have to fight for. But remember, I also said that the, the, what, what we like and the optimal is not necessarily feasible. We need to do certain things to get there, build narratives and so on. On the other hand, we have a system which only cares about profit, right? Within this system, still we are we should be able to find some solutions which are profitable and can function. There are now many many um, you know right now the energy crisis in Europe is a good opportunity for any any tech company that is dealing with energy management, energy demand management, energy supply management, and so on. And and we we are seeing these companies growing. Uh, so that is why in recent years we are seeing green tech um, growing, but they only function if if there is profit saving, if there is there is increased profit or cost saving. Yes, you can sell them to you have you can have a different technology which doesn't make sense economically. Well, you 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 can sell it to a company which is doing greenwashing, but that has a limited time, like you know lifetime. After a while, that technology goes to garbage. Your solution goes to garbage because it doesn't make sense, and and that is what we are seeing with all a lot of these indices that are used by Wall Street and 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 stockbrokers and so on and regard you know for for value for measuring sus sustainability of of different companies and their green their environmental impact and so on. Um, so my my point is that even within this system, because the inefficiencies are huge, because we we have a lot of um, you know, opportunities for moving things around, exchanges between the systems, production somewhere else, and use somewhere else. Uh, there are there are opportunities for optimizing and improving these systems with the thinking of that at the end I have to sell this pro product to a, a, a person who's interested in profit making, to a policymakers who who has a different incentive to make decision than the environmentalist who is talking about the change and, and so on. Uh, I think there are solutions, and at least the people I'm working with me around me uh, you know, are proving that um, this is po po possible. Um, in the last few years, I've helped a lot of start, not a lot, but a, 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 at least three startups um, who are in this space and, and are doing things related to behavior change, energy management, um, and, and they're making profit. Oh, well, thank you so much. I think your, your really exciting and wonderful talk has sparked a whole bunch of other questions, which I hope it's all right, we'll, we'll send to you to, to answer afterwards. And I'd like to, again, thank you very much for your talk today. Um, thank and, you. And thank you all for all of the listeners too, for sending in the questions. And, and, and just so you know, I, 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 I received the text message from um, Professor Medellin Azwar, I, I know that in, in Merced, they're also watching the talk. So um, hi to people in Merced. It's, it's great um, to also be back to Merced virtually. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for everyone for, for attending. And I hope um, this is useful. I'd be happy to answer questions later on. Please um, also check what we are, um, check out what we are doing at the United Nations University. It's an interesting setting. Uh, where we want to um, do a little bit of, you know, in addition to research and capacity building, we want to do advocacy, we want to help the policymakers and connect the academics with the policymakers and the societies in need, need of um, solutions. Um, as of February 1st next year, I would be also moving um, to the United Nations University in Canada 
which is dealing with um, water issues. So I'll be happy to collaborate with you, uh, especially those who are working in the water, health and environmental sector. Thank you, Kaveh. Thank you, Marianne. We both really appreciate um, you moderating 